Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Bible study with the Lombard Church of the Nazarene. I'm so glad that you joined us tonight as we read through uh, 1 John chapter 3. We're working through this letter, this epistle of John. There are three of them together, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Remember, this is the same uh, John that was a disciple of Jesus, wrote the Gospel of John, and also this is the same John, the Revelator, who wrote the book of Revelation. We've been taking a look at 1 John chapters 1 and 2, and today we're going to tackle the first uh, half of, of chapter 3. And you remember, it began by John saying that he had first-hand contact with Jesus. He walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, he listened to what Jesus said, he physically touched Jesus, and now he is giving first-hand accounts of what he experienced and the things that he heard with Jesus. He's uh, basically clarifying some things. He says there are false teachers that are among the church, and they are teaching things that are not uh, in, in alignment with what Jesus said or taught. And so he's clarifying those things. In the last chapter, we read that there were three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he's talking about how we are tempted to sin, but we're not to sin. And he talked about how there are people who deny that Jesus is the way or Jesus is the only way to God. And he called them antichrists. There are more than one antichrist. We talk about in the end about an antichrist rising to power, but there are many, many antichrists around us. We hear stories from people all the time of, no, all roads lead to God. And they, go to, they worship the same God that we do. No, he is saying that those are antichrists. Uh, Jesus is the only way. And so that's what, uh, catching you up, what he was talking about in the past. And now let's take a look at 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 1. He says, see, how, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Amen. So, just contextually, the last verse in 1 John chapter 2 ends with saying, uh, You know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. And so John um, mentioned that we're being born of God, born of, of Jesus. And if we are born of God, now he continues that thought here in chapter 3, that we are called the children of God, because if we are born of God, we are children of God. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished upon us. God loves us so much, and how did he lavish or extravagantly bestow upon us through his love? What did he did? He said, I'm going to adopt you. I'm going to make you my kids, uh, not children of a man and a woman, but children of God, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all things. We can be his children. Praise the Lord. That's how God lavished love upon us. God knows us. And the world doesn't. It says that here. We live in a fallen world, but we are the family of God and not the family with the world. And so the world doesn't recognize us. They don't know us because they didn't know our Father. They didn't know Jesus. And so because they didn't recognize Jesus, they don't recognize the family of God. And so we don't always fit in here in the world. We're not part of the family of the world. We're part of the family of of God. Isn't that exciting? It goes on in verse 2 to say, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. We are the children of God right now. It, you notice it didn't say, in the future we will be the children of God. When, when Jesus returns, we'll be the children of God. No, we are. Right now, we have to get in our minds and our hearts. We have to get that mindset that we currently now are the children of God. We have a Father who is the creator of all things. Now, we don't know all that's going to happen in the future. Our Father knows that. In heaven, just like little children don't always know what the parents are planning, but they have plans, right? And so uh, you'll you'll they'll figure it out. Uh, have you ever been in a car with children? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Where are we going? What are we going to do? Asking all those questions. 
we're the children of God. We sometimes wonder what what's all going to be, what it's all going to be like, and when Jesus will return. But God knows those things. But what we do know is that we are His children, and that's what is important. Jesus is God's Son, and He is coming. Jesus, God's firstborn, His Son, is coming, and we will be like Him joint heirs with Jesus, and we will see Jesus as he is. Amen. We're going to truly see. We're going to be in a full relationship with Jesus. Nothing, No barriers, no confusion, no cloudiness of our vision. We're truly going to see Jesus for who he really is. Isn't that exciting? We're going to be face to face. 1 John 3, 3 then goes on to say, All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. See, we have hope. Our hope is that we are the children of God and Jesus is coming and we are going to be with him and we will see him clearly and we will be like him. All this puts hope in us, right? Does that not make you hopeful tonight that what we are going through in this earth is temporary, but we are children of God in the midst of a broken world and one day Jesus is coming and we're going to be with him forever? Yeah, that should give us hope. And today, if we are the children of God, he, he builds this, this argument here saying then we are, if we're awaiting that Savior, we are going to be pure because we are the children of God. We're not the children of the devil. We're not the children of the world. We're children of God. Our DNA is now of God. And so we're not going to live like the people of the world, live like the people of the devil. We're going to live like Jesus. And we're becoming more and more and more like Jesus. We are pure. We are not living of the world, not living in the world of sin, of the world of sin. We are called to be pure. He goes on to say in verse 4 then, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. So he's telling us we need to be pure. We shouldn't be sinners. We shouldn't be choosing sin in the world that we live. We're not perfect, but we are striving per, for that perfection, and we're tri striving not to sin. We don't want to sin. We should want to be pure. That's what he just said. Pure meaning not touching sin, not speaking sin, not living in sin. Sin, he says, breaks God's law, and it makes us then impure. So if we're going to be pure, we need to hold to God's law, hold to who God says he is and what he desires us to be. He goes on to say sin is lawlessness, that we break laws like there are no laws. If we live like there are no laws of God, it's basically acting as if it's, there's lawlessness. But God is a God of order. God is a God of purity and righteousness and holiness. And we are called to be holy like he is holy. We're called to be pure like he is pure. And so we need to stay away from sin and strive to live like Jesus. Because this whole theme, we are the children of God. Verse 5 then says, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. In Jesus, there is no sin. He came to us. He came for us, taking away our sin. Not just taking away our past sin, today's sin. So I don't keep on sinning. Uh, we, today, we have many choices. And God uh, came so that we don't have to choose sin. Praise the Lord. We can choose to do what is right, what is pure. Uh, not just past tense, but sin right now in our life today. Jesus is alive. He's alive in us, and in him there is no sin. It goes on to say in verse 6, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. So if we're living in Jesus and Jesus is in us, we allow him to guide us and to lead us. He's not going to lead us into sin. He's not going to guide us into sin because that's not his desire for us. So if that's the truth, if Jesus is in us and at work in us, we should not continue to keep on sinning like we were sinning before. Uh, Jesus, if we keep on sinning, Jesus isn't our Lord. He's not, uh, we talked about previously, Lord is our supreme authority. If Jesus is our supreme authority, we are doing what Jesus would want us to do. That does not include sin. 
We can't say, uh, sorry, we can't sin and say that we know him. No, it says here we can't. And so, you know, the early church, and we hear it today too, uh, he's dealing, John is speaking to these, the theology of these false teachers saying, oh no, we're, you have to keep sinning, keep sinning. It's all right, Jesus loves you, just keep on sinning. No, that's not what John is saying here. He's saying he heard and spoke with Jesus, t talked to Jesus, heard Jesus teach, and what he taught was to stop sinning. Verse 7 then says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. So here he refers to us as children again. We are the children of God. Uh, but like children, we have to be careful not to allow other people to lead us astray. These false teachers or the enemy pulling us into sin. We can't allow ourselves to go down those paths to believing sin is okay, to be wanting sin or choosing sin. Jesus is righteous. He does what is right. And we are called to righteousness as well. He makes that clear here. So we must do what is right, which means live a life not choosing sin. Verse 8 goes on to say, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Sin, why don't we do sin? Sin is the work of the devil. If people sin, then they're doing the work of the devil. Now here's the reality. We all have sinned and therefore have done the work of the devil in our lives. But Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. In other words, to destroy sin and the work of sin in our lives. Jesus came to destroy it. So therefore, we must not embrace sin. We must not condone sin. Instead, we must allow God to destroy sin in our lives so it has no power over us anymore. So we can live pure lives and be righteous. Verse 9 then says, No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. So God's plan isn't for us to keep on sinning. His plan for us is to be born again, spiritually born again. Jesus talked with Nicodemus about that. Uh, John wrote about that before. And now we are seeing that if God is born in us, we are li he is our father. It's like a seed that is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. God's word is in us so we don't keep on sinning. We are now on, with a new father, God, and he is that seed that is in us, that new DNA that's in us, so we are not living in sin. God is growing in us like a seed, so there should be no room for sin. Finally, verse 10 says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the, devil, uh, the children of the devil are, what is right, I'm sorry, anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. With these principles that we have been talking about in these previous verses, we can know who the children of God are. Notice the colon here, so we know who the children of God are. Those who are not sinning are the children of God. Those who are living in sin are children of the devil. I know this sounds harsh, John, but John comes right out and says it. If people are making the choice to continue living in sin, then they can't say that they're children of God. Well, I guess they could say it, but it's not true. Uh, it, truly, those who are children of God are those who are living in the ways of God. And here it goes on to say, uh, anyone who does not love their brother or sister. See, there's a sin of omission. Sin isn't only just doing something bad. But sometimes it's not doing something good. And in this case, he says not loving. If we don't love people, we're sinning. So it's not sin isn't only just going out and doing something bad. Sometimes sin is not doing something good. And we are called to be loving people. So we need to love our brothers and sisters because that is the way of God. So that's the first section here in 1 John chapter 3 talking about being children of God. My prayer is that all of you who are listening are children of God, that you've given your life to Jesus and committed to him. If we can pray for you or you're not sure what it means to be a follower of Jesus or you have questions, feel free to reach out to us through the website or through the prayer request uh, email here. But 
let's pray for you. God, we thank you that you are a loving God, that you care for us. Thank you for showing us the way through your son, Jesus. I ask that we would become your children. Everyone who is listening would give their lives to you. Let you come in and be their Lord, their supreme authority in their lives. Wash away the sins because you paid for them and help us to sin no more. Help us to overcome the sin and the temptations of this world. For we don't want to be children of the devil. We want to be children of you. Help us to be overcomers of sin. We only could do it with your help, God. So help us in this. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us tonight as we started reading through 1 John chapter 3. Join us next time as we'll continue reading through that same book, finish up 1 John chapter 3. God bless you. Remember, Jesus loves you, and so do we.